Good evening, everyone. Hoping everyone can see myself and Nelson. If you can hear me okay, or can hear me, that would be great. To, if you can put a, a Y in the, the question panel, that would be great. We normally, in these webinars, we use the question panel for our communications. So if you're new to our webinar tonight, our, uh, this is the, the fourth part of our masterclass series with the CME Group, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And if you're here, if you've been here for our last, our previous three webinars, well, thank you for joining again for this one. This is going to be really interesting. It's it's uh, it's an interesting subject. I've I haven't really studied much about the wheat or corn futures before, but uh, I know it's it's a, it's a great product to understand because it really is the foundation of the futures markets. Without without grains, agricultural products. We wouldn't have had the futures markets. Uh, so the, the these products actually create the, the structure and the foundation for you know all the other products which are traded. The whole system uh, was you know the CME group. Their, their first products they ever traded were were agricultural products. You know like butter, eggs, milk, grains, wheat, corn, uh, meat, all those types of products. So uh, tonight we're very uh, very happy and and um, and really proud to have uh, Nelson Lowe on today, who's going to be talking to us about the wheat and corn futures and how you can get involved through the CME group to trade these products. So, welcome, Nelson. Thank you, uh, thank you, Cameron. Thank you for a very kind introduction as well as the opportunity to uh, speak to the audience. Um, uh, as Cameron has said, uh, my name is Nelson. Uh, I take care of the CME group of uh, CME suite of agricultural products uh, in the region. And uh, today I'm going to talk about something that's uh, dear to everyone's heart and more importantly, dear to everyone's stomach, uh, which <laughs> is uh, food items that's, uh, that you, you're probably going to you're probably going to dig into right after this, I presume. It's dinner time, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll um, we're going to get right into the to, into the meat of the the presentation very soon. Um, can you tell us a little bit of background about yourself? Like, how did you get involved in in being involved with wheat and corn futures? Sure. Um, so, uh, uh, by way of introduction, uh, I started out my my career uh, way back, um, more than twenty over years back, uh, actually trading these commodities. Uh, I was actually a physical trader. Uh, yep. And um, uh, we, I, I worked in the Asian, the Asian, the the Asia Pacific office, uh, which was based in Singapore, and I'm still based in Singapore right now for CME Group. Uh, yes. And we, we traded wheat, corn, soybean, soybean meal, soybean oil, uh, all around the region, but primarily to China because China is a very big importer of all these commodities. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. We look forward to hearing about your experience and your knowledge. So. Uh, and we'll be passing back to Nelson very soon. I'm just going to go through our introduction slides. So tonight we're just going to go through our compliance slides. We've learned a little bit about Nelson. Uh, we're going to talk about why we trade the futures markets. We're going to explore the world of wheat and corn futures tonight. And I'll be talking a little bit about the contract specifications and just a little bit of information on how you can trade these types of uh, commodities, like what's the what things to look out for in terms of some fundamental analysis and a, and a little bit of technical analysis as well and uh, what sort of charts you can use to, to to look at these markets. We'll also do a big Q&A session at the end uh, when we wrap up the masterclass. So first of all uh, we do need to run through our compliance slides very quickly and just to let you know that we are the International Day Trading Academy. We are corporate authorised representatives of Beyond Capital Asset Management for the purpose of futures trading education. Our AFSL number is 484045 and if you'd like to read our FSG, our Financial Services Guide, it is on our website www.idta.com.au. Now we do have to let you know that trading futures and other products on margin does carry a high level of risk, it may not be suitable for all investors. So trading securities with money borrowed from a broker, this has the effect of allowing you to trade a large position in the market, market than you could otherwise trade based on your account balance. So just be mindful that with the leverage it's, it's, that's used uh, in the futures uh, markets, uh, it can magnify any profit uh, from the trade as well as magnifying any loss from the trade. 
Um, so we do use leverage um, and we do use money uh, borrowed from the broker slash clearinghouse to be able to trade the position size that we can trade. There are risks in trading. You have the risk of gaining money. You also have the risk of losing money also. And tonight's presentation is only general, general information only. We're not financial planners. We don't give personal advice. And um, uh, so you should really consider your uh, financial needs and personal objectives before uh, considering trading the futures markets and also past performance. Uh, tonight, we really won't be giving you any trade recommendations or anything like that, but past performance of this product is not and should not be taken as an indication of future performance. So caution should be always exercised in assessing past performance. This product, like all other financial products, is subject to market forces and unpredictable events that may adversely affect future performance. So tonight really is an educational event. It's all it's just about introducing our members and also any of our guests uh, who found out about this webinar from uh, various uh, social media sources or from uh, Your Trading Edge magazine. We welcome you. Uh, but tonight is all about an introduction to uh, how you can get involved in these incredible products um, as, that the CME group offer, as well as, as, as many other products that we've talked about over the last uh, three uh, masterclasses. So a bit of background about myself. I am a day trader. Uh, I'm a passionate day trader. I do love the share markets. I do love, really, I, I just love the whole uh, science around trading, um, you know, I'm really, I, I love studying uh, peak performance, uh, particularly, you know, trading is, a, is a, a performance activity. It is all about making good decisions. Uh, so I do love studying the psychology around making good decisions. And, and a part of that is having uh, a great system and a great process to analyze the markets, to be able to make those trading decisions. So, you know, we support people in developing trading plans to be able to trade the markets of their choice. I do also write for the Your Trading Edge magazine as an industry commentator and a regular contributor uh, in this magazine. So that's a little bit about myself. A bit about IDTA, uh, we are a global enterprise delivering trading education, financial investment systems alongside our sister company, Beyond Capital Asset Management. We have futures traders in over 21 countries around, us, around the world, primarily in Australia and New Zealand, uh, but also we have a big member base up in Malaysia and, and in Singapore as well. Uh, we provide uh, education, uh, we've got professional traders that call trades in our trading rooms, we have coaches, mentors, and we provide proprietary trading systems and indicators as well. And we do have uh, four trading rooms, um, we have two in the US session, Euro session, and plus we do have an Asian trading room also, and we also have a lot of our trading community hubs also. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about, um, I guess, the, the benefits of uh, trading the futures markets. I, I'm sure um, I'll pass over to Nelson after this slide. But uh, one thing about agricultural futures, uh, it is very much affected by weather conditions, um, especially because the major markets uh, are, you know, United States products. Um, so, you know, Chicago wheat or Kansas City wheat or United States corn. So that's what the, the, the markets we are trading, but they are affected by weather conditions, not only in the United States, but also supply and demand is affected by uh, what happens around the world as well. So it's a, the great thing about these products is they're quite seasonally, um, well, not pre, you, you can't say they're predictable, but you, you can. there's times when you can tell the market's gonna be volatile and the markets are gonna be particularly quiet. Um, the demand for US crops is also inversely correlated with the United States dollar. So basically what that means, and we'll, we'll go through, and I'm sure Nelson can explain that a little bit more as well, is just that if the US dollar is high, it, it brings down the demand for those US products, um, for those US crops. So uh, obviously the prices can be affect because they've got an increased supply due to that low demand. The great thing about also the agriculture futures is there is a lot of data that comes out from the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA. And this data is very accurate and very readily available. So it, it's, um, you know, if you do like researching, uh, if you like the weather, if you like studying the weather, uh, it, and because, you know, <laughs> weather is a subject on, you know, you, you turn on the television and uh, weather is a big part of the, the TV uh, uh, news broadcast. Um, you know, tuning into the weather can, can give you a, a good a bit of an idea of what's happening in these uh, types of agricultural products. They're also great for more experienced type arbitrage traders that look for 
price spreads between all the different types of markets because there is there are different wheat products as well that you can trade. So there's different uh, there's different products and they they're priced differently. So um, more expert type traders uh, also look at using arbitrage options as well. We don't teach you know people how to arbitrage. It's it is a, definitely a skill, but it's definitely done by a lot of big traders uh, around the world. Uh, and also once again, you do with the futures markets, you have the ability to trade you know 22 hours a day. Uh, five days a week and once again we trade directly to the exchange as well with the majority of the products as well. So Nelson I'll come back but I'm going to hand over to you and uh, if you can run through and explain a little bit more about um, you know what's what what futures corn and futures wheat's all about it'd be great so I'll just um, set this up for you and allow you to present your slides. There you go that should work now. Okay, let me do this and can you see this, Cam? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, great. Uh, th uh, thanks again, uh, Cameron, for the for the very kind introduction, and uh, and it's great to to speak to everyone. Uh, I have to say that trading is very dear to my heart as well. Uh, like everybody here on the on the call, I mean, I assume that you're all traders, and that's why you're you're darling and listening to this. Uh, I I I also had the um, the pleasure to obviously trade uh, at the start of my career. I was a trader, uh, and um, uh, for for many years uh, before actually moving to the exchange. So um, my background is that I actually traded these markets, uh, and as mentioned earlier on, I was actually based in Singapore, and I. Uh, you know, uh, traded uh, the U.S. Uh, these U.S. commodities uh, into the region, and it's it's um it's um uh, as as many of you know, and and I know uh, agriculture is uh, is very dear to um, uh, many Australians' hearts and, and New Zealanders' hearts as well, um, because of the big scale of the uh, the industry there, um, and as you know, uh, Asia is a very big importer of of agriculture. And uh, no surprises there when you have two thirds of the world's population sitting on one third of the world's land mass. Uh, you, you essentially get a lot of uh, agricultural trade uh, that will move primarily from west to east. Um, as, uh, as those markets there, um, in terms of population densities, uh, is much lesser than, than what it is in, in Asia. Um, so I will begin by just uh, talking about uh, agriculture and um, this slide I just wanted to show you that you know it, it, uh, uh, there's many ways to say it you know uh, some people say ag some people say agri some people say agriculture now you obviously know that but I wanted to put this slide out there because uh, from time to time you will hear me say ag or agri and uh, oftentimes I do get uh, friends and um, and viewers that they wonder what what what's ag what, what is he saying so it's actually just a short form for agriculture um, so many different ways of saying it, but it means the same thing. Um, it's a very important part of uh, any asset class mix. Uh, and uh, if you haven't looked at, uh, at agriculture, I, I, would, I would encourage you to look at it. Um, as you can see, this is uh, the sector breakdown uh, for the Bloomberg Commodity Index. And uh, you'll see that uh, it's uh, largely broken down into three very broad categories uh, within commodities. And uh, you see uh, just very roughly, energy is roughly about one third. Um, metals uh, is roughly about one third as well between precious and industrial. Uh, and uh, the livestock and grains and the softs, they compromise of the last one third. So it's a, it's a very balanced index to be calm, but it also goes to show how important agriculture is in, in any portfolio if you're diversifying. Of course, you know, uh, the fact that I, I've, uh, I, I will tell you in the coming slides uh, how exciting a market it is. Um, now, at the CME group, uh, there's mainly four very broad categories of agricultural products uh, that we have. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the exchange, uh, you'll know that we are multi-asset class. You know, we have interest rates, uh, foreign exchange, uh, equity indexes, uh, energy and metals, and of course, we have agriculture. Uh, but within the agricultural suite, uh, you'll see that it's mainly broken down into these four uh, very broad categories, of which the one that I will focus on today will be uh, the grains and all seeds. And I'll be talking primarily about wheat and corn. 
Uh, the grids and all seats form a very important part uh, of the um, of the business, and um, and here you'll see uh, a chart showing the total volume uh, that of all CME agricultural products, all those four uh, categories that I that I had shown in the slide earlier. Uh, they are total volumes uh, over a course of a period of years, and you see that uh, volumes are running in excess of about 350 million contracts uh, per annum. So if you take that and you divide that roughly by 250 or 260 trading days, that's about one and a half million contracts a day. So these contracts are very liquid, uh, very actively traded, and um, and um, and definitely, uh, you know, if you talk about uh, you know uh, trading these uh, uh, electronically, uh, it should be not a problem for you to get uh, liquidity both uh, going in and coming out. Um, next slide. Okay, so. I will begin to talk about uh, corn and wheat, uh, but first I wanted to touch on corn first. Um, and the reason is because uh, while, while Australia doesn't really grow very much corn, uh, it's primarily a wheat uh, country, um, corn is, is, is by far uh, the biggest um, uh, agricultural commodity uh, in the world. And on top of that, it's uh, also the biggest uh, product that's grown in the United States as well. Um, so it's a very important product, um, and um, and and what what often surprises many uh, uh, members of the audience whenever I present this, uh, it may be no surprise to you because I'm sure this audience here is much more familiar familiar with agriculture than some of the other uh, groups that I speak to or lecture to. Uh, but in essence, basically, what really surprises a lot of uh, folks uh, is that it's really not grown for food. Uh, it's actually grown for feed for animal feeding. Uh, and corn is really largely used in, in animal rations, uh, whether be it feeding uh, cattle or, or feeding hogs or feeding chickens. Uh, it's, it's the main source of carbohydrate uh, that's used to feed these animals. Um, the US is the gro biggest grower of corn. Uh, and what also comes as a surprise to many is China is actually a very big grower of corn as well. Um, and on, in the import side, it's kind of uh, broken down between many different uh, countries, but Japan is actually the world's largest importer of corn in the world. So it's very front and center uh, in the region. Uh, it's not just a U.S. commodity per se. Uh, it, it's obviously grown in the U.S. Uh, and the futures contract is based on, on U.S. corn. Uh, but by far and by large, you see that um, Asia is very deeply involved and integrated into the corn uh, supply demand uh, chain. Now, meat demand, uh, as mentioned earlier on, corn is primarily used to feed animals in, in animal rations. So meat demand has a very big impact on the demand for corn. And what you see is that uh, there's still a lot of potential for uh, meat consumption to expand and hence corn demand. Uh, you'll, you'll see that um, many parts of uh, the world, uh, China included, is only a fraction of, uh, well, in this case, half of the per capita meat consumption uh, in the US. And in India, it's even way smaller. It's only 2.9 kilos uh, compared to the US at 95 uh, kilos per person. Um, the, the last thing that's worth mentioning is that corn is used to also produce ethanol. And ethanol is used as a fuel in gasoline blends uh, for passenger cars. And this is actually the second largest uh, use of corn in the US. I'll, I'll show and illustrate this in, a, in, a, in the next couple of slides. Okay, so here you see uh, the top four producers in the world of corn, and you see that uh, the U.S. is uh, by far the, the leader among the four, and uh, China comes with a very close second, even though you don't really hear of uh, uh, Chinese corn. You, you rarely hear about it, and, and that's because uh, the, the population is, is so huge and massive that all the corn that's produced uh, is used domestically, so almost little or none of it is exported. And in fact, China has now turned into a net importer, um, changing uh, over the years where they were once actually an exporter. They are now, they are now actually a very big importer. And I'll talk about uh, the trade deal that has been signed with the United States uh, uh, further down the presentation. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about supply demand. Uh, supply demand is a very important part uh, when it comes to commodities. Um, the markets, uh, when in imbalance, uh, will move in either direction depending on whether supply exceeds demand or demand exceeds supply. Um, it's basically economics 101. 
And here you see corn total supply. Uh, you see that over the years, the US corn supply has increased. Um, and what's meaningful to note here is that uh, these increases have been, um, have been steadily growing over the years. And that's because of improved corn genetics as well as uh, uh, improved um, uh, planting and crop maintenance methods. As, as you know, uh, technology today plays a bigger and bigger role in this with, uh, with, with all the, uh, 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 what the industry will call ag tech. It helps to um, uh, better uh, ensure that crops are supplied with the water it requires as well as uh, with whatever, um, whatever um, um, uh, other components, uh, things like fertilizers or uh, pesticides or uh, wherever they are required. So ag tech is now beginning to play a very big role uh, in agriculture as well. Um, on the usage side, you see that uh, it follows a similar pattern, but I think what's of interest here is really to show you this slide. Um, that once upon a time, most of the corn was actually used for feeding animals, um, and in this case, uh, going to exports uh, overseas uh, from the US. But beginning uh, the, in, in the early 2000s, you see this little yellow bar here that you see that keeps growing every year. This is primarily driven by ethanol demand in the United States. And uh, you see that a lot of corn-based ethanol uh, has begun to be produced over the years. And today it's kind of reached a plateau and uh, it's, it's very consistently taking up between 40 to 45% of all the corn uh, uh, demand um, uh, in the US. So it's, 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 play, it's playing a very big part uh, in terms of demand and will continue to play a very big part. Um, okay, so when you look at supply and you look at demand, um, uh, agriculture traders always like to look at two things, um, ending stocks, you know, what's, what's left over after you um, produce the crop and you use it, uh, what's left over, that's basically the ending stocks. Uh, and another metric that traders like to look at is this thing called the stocks to use ratio. Now, the stocks to use ratio is, is as the name implies, is basically the ending stocks divided by the usage. And you get a ratio that's left over. In the case of this chart, you see that the ratio is standing at about, uh, around about maybe slightly more than 14%, uh, the, the little blue line. And you see that that kind of tells you how well supplied um, uh, corn is uh, to the market. So if the stocks use ratio is really low, it means that um, you know, it, it, it may not, uh, whatever available stocks th there is will not last for a long time and therefore uh, the market may need to ration uh, demand by raising prices and vice versa. If the stocks use ratio is high, it means that the market has a lot of leftover stock or a lot of uh, leftover carry out and hence, as a result, uh, the market actually has to uh, increase demand and hence uh, prices would actually uh, go down to, to stimulate demand. So the stocks usually show is a really great um, indicator uh, for, uh, for uh, and, and the industry does look at it uh, very regularly as a very good indicator of the, uh, the health of um, the supply demand balance. Um, this is the balance as well as the uh, the ratio for the world and you see that it's slightly different from the slide uh, previously in the US where it's kind of flat over the last few years. Here you actually see um, the stocks use ratio uh, tape, uh, dropping and, and, and uh, plunging over the last few years and this is largely driven by the fact that um, China has begun to draw down a lot of their corn stocks. Um, they are a very big part of this uh, uh, orange bar that you see here. And uh, over the years, they have begun to draw down a large amount of their national reserve. And as a result, what you see is that um, the stocks use ratio has begun to drop. And usage ha has increased uh, over the years. Uh, and I'll show you a, a couple of slides after that uh, to indicate to you where the usage is going to. Now, um, now for everyone's uh, kind of like uh, eagle eye view, um, uh, it would be really great to know exactly where corn is grown in the United States. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you have a relative or a friend living uh, in the Midwest, you know, in Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Iowa, Illinois, um, you, know, you know that they are right in the heart of the action and you can pick up the phone and call them and ask them, you know, how's the weather doing? 
because they, they're right in the heart of the corn growing belt, which is the dark green uh, squares. And where it's grown elsewhere is in the light green squares. So those are the minor crop areas. And where it's white, um, no corn is grown. Um, now, another important thing to, to, uh, to also um, uh, keep in mind uh, when trading is also the uh, seasonality of the, of the commodity. In this case, uh, corn or wheat are what you call seasonal commodities, so they're produced every year. Uh, and the growing cycle or the planting cycle, or rather the crop cycle, uh, will also help to inform um, the trader on the volatility of the market as well. So this gives you uh, how the cycle is in the United States and China and, and the EU. Um, most corn is actually produced in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, not so much in the Southern. Brazil is beginning to be a big producer, uh, but still the bulk of uh, corn production is actually found in the Northern Hemisphere. So these are the three big countries that are, that are worth uh, paying attention to. Uh, when it comes to, to uh, following uh, the weather cycles as well as the crop cycles. Um, there's two particular stages that I like to point uh, the audience to. And the first is the planting, um, the planting window. And that's from April to May in the United States. The other is actually the second uh, stage here that I mentioned in late June to early August. And this is the silking or rather what is known as the pollination phase. Uh, now, if, if, you, if you know a farmer or you're a farmer in, in Australia or elsewhere in the world, uh, you'll know exactly what, uh, what this means. This basically means the, the most volatile period of the commodity, uh, simply because of the fact that um, uh, getting, the, getting the seeds into the ground uh, on the right time in the right window is very important. So that's a very important period. If you can't get the seeds in at the right time, then uh, planting could be a disaster and the crop could, could, uh, uh, could have a bad outcome. And the other very big window is also the silking and pollination window, uh, because that's when, uh, in the case of corn, uh, that's when the head of, the cob of corn actually, uh, or, or rather the weather will actually decide uh, how many little corn kernels uh, actually form on that cob of corn. So if, you, if you've ever eaten a cob of corn where there weren't that many kernels, uh, compared to another one where there were loads and loads of kernels, then you'll know that the one with fewer kernels is the one that didn't pollinate well uh, in July and August. So these are the two most volatile periods uh, and markets really react uh, to every little bit of information that comes into the marketplace because uh, all it takes is really just bad weather uh, and it can uh, make a huge change um, in the supply. Now, so uh, the question is, and, and, and Cam uh, um, made a very good comment uh, earlier on about the USDA being a really great source of information. Um, one really great thing about trading US commodities is the fact that, uh, and in the case of agriculture, uh, you have what is known as the um, agriculture agency in the United States, known as the USDA, um, basically short form for the United States Department of Agriculture. They produce a lot of very great statistics and information, and there's loads. I, I, there's no way I can show you all of it uh, on, on this short presentation. So feel free to go to their website and to look around for all the information. Uh, but this is one chart that I wanted to, to show you, and I've also included the link uh, to their website. And this is the crop progress and condition uh, of uh, different crops in the United States. And um, what you see here on this chart, um, it's really very busy, I know, uh, I apologize. And uh, if you have time and you, when you go to, these, uh, to the site to have a really close look, but what this really gives you is really gives you a control panel view of what's going on in terms of the crop. Uh, you can see the condition in the current year. Uh, in this case, uh, the corn crop has come to an end. Uh, it's, really in the mid it's really almost fully harvested, uh, but that's shown by the red line which is the 2020 crop. And they stack it up against the previous five years. Uh, you also see uh, the ratings of the condition of the crop, uh, as well as the progress of the crop. So, and you can compare as well versus previous years, and you can basically see how fast, uh, how far ahead or how far behind uh, the crop is this year compared to, to previous years. So this is a really great uh, uh, infographic, uh, and I encourage you to uh, go to the USDA site and have a really good view of this.
Okay, um, I wanted to touch a couple of things, and uh, I mentioned ethanol is a very big driver of um, uh, demand growth over the last few years. Uh, and I thought it, it's worth sharing with the audience um, the, this thing known as the RFS mandate in the US, which is basically uh, what's driving all the uh, corn demand uh, for ethanol. Uh, and that's basically, basically because in the US, uh, there's, a very, there's, a, there's a mandate, um, or rather the use of ethanol is mandated by the RFS um, for corn-based ethanol to be used uh, in uh, ethanol production to be used uh, to be mixed up with gasoline. And uh, this, as you know, um, uh, is, is, uh, has been implemented for many years now by the, um, by the, um, uh, by the US Department of Transport and EPA. Uh, but in essence, basically, it's a move towards using more uh, renewable fuels uh, and to encourage the use of renewable fuels uh, in the United States. And, um, and uh, it, in a nutshell, basically, uh, corn-based ethanol falls under D6, which is the conventional renewable fuel. And you'll see that in the previous slide, uh, that, that, um, that demand for the renewable fuel has kind of hit a, hit a plateau already. And that's seen in the earlier slides where you saw uh, the demand having a kind of flatlined, uh, but it's, it's really made a big difference in the sense of how uh, corn is used today. It's not only used to feed animals, but also used uh, for uh, producing uh, ethanol for, for energy. Um, uh, and the US is not the only country uh, to be doing it. Uh, China is actually in the early stages of actually uh, investigating whether or not uh, ethanol should be a um, major source of uh, fuel uh, uh, for the for their future. And um, what you'll see here is that uh, they've actually done some trials as well as uh, mandated uh, an E10. E10 basically means a 90% uh, gasoline, 10% ethanol mix uh, in the fuel. And what you see is that China has begun to kind of study and evaluate how uh, whether this is a good solution to the uh, uh, to the pollution in the country. As you know, a lot of the pollution in the country is caused by the factories that are running, as well as uh, uh, vehicular transport, buses, cars, uh, etc. And uh, if you follow the news, you'll know that China is a very big adopter as well for uh, uh, electric cars and buses. Uh, they're really make, making trying to make a big move into it. Uh, it's really for very practical purposes that they're doing this. Uh, it's because um, the level of pollution in China is, is uh, air pollution is really bad. Uh, so they're really trying to find ways to solve it. And the E10 mandate is something that they are looking at and studying uh, to see whether or not it will help in uh, improving uh, the air quality over in, in, uh, in China. Um, so uh, you'll see here China is really a big user. Uh, it's really produced more than 1 million gallon, a billion gallons of ethanol. Uh, and it's now the fourth largest ethanol producer in the world. And if the, uh, the mandate comes into effect, meaning to say that uh, based on their studies, uh, they, they feel comfortable that uh, it makes sense for them to implement it countrywide, what you'll see is a very sharp increase in uh, ethanol consumption. And with that, something needs to fuel that ethanol production. And corn being one of the cheapest carbohydrates around is a very likely uh, candidate uh, for production of ethanol. And this is actually a, a chart from the uh, Iowa State University. Uh, they did a study into it, and it's really their projection on where they think uh, corn, uh, corn demand will be if China were to implement the mandate in full. And they're projecting as much as 50 million tons of imports uh, in uh, by, you know, uh, they're talking as soon as 2019, 2020. This was a study done a few years ago. Uh, it hasn't hit that level yet, uh, but you can see obviously the impact if they were to really move into um, an E10 mandate. And of course, E10 is not, not the limit. Uh, uh, it's shown that you can go even higher to E20 or E30 if, if need be. So whether this would be a big driver of prices, um, uh, I couldn't tell you, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but for sure, if you're trading corn, uh, pay attention to what's going on in the ethanol industry as well. 
Um, okay, I'll move on very quickly from corn um, and move on to wheat. And I'll kind of end off uh, the, the wheat section by explaining uh, why, is, why both commodities are interesting and, and, and the interaction between the two of them. Uh, now, wheat. Uh, for those of you who are, uh, know, know an Australian farmer or are familiar with wheat or you are an Australian farmer growing wheat, then you know this is this is really going to be really boring to you this part of it, but you know I'm, I'll promise you that the rest of it will be quite interesting. Um, now wheat is a really great uh, commodity as you know, um, and it's a very big uh, product as well. It's grown on more land than any other crop in the world, and more wheat is grown than rice even. Um, it's mainly used for food as opposed to corn, uh, which is mainly used for feed and ethanol, uh, and the main usage goes really to make bread and noodle. Uh, now, here's a surprise to non-wheat uh, uh, followers. Uh, China is actually the world's largest producer of wheat, uh, followed by India, who's the second largest producer. So you'll, you'll soon come to see, when you look at the exporter list, you'll actually not see China and India at all. Uh, and that's because everything that's produced is consumed uh, domestically. Now, um, I, I, I wanted to share with you that uh, we have four wheat contracts available at the CME. Uh, two of them are U.S. wheat contracts, uh, mainly the Kansas City wheat contract and the Chicago Board of Trade wheat contract. Uh, they're both very liquid contracts that's traded uh, electronically on screen. But I also just wanted to highlight, especially for this audience, uh, what's true and dear to my heart, um, which is the Australian wheat contract that we launched in 2017. And you see that this contract has traded uh, over the last uh, four years since launch, uh, and it primarily trades with, uh, within a window. Um, it's not uh, really an, uh, a, a contract that's traded on screen, um, but more or less, it's more, more oftenly traded uh, as blocks uh, in the marketplace. Um, and, and what's really interesting about the Australian wheat contract is that uh, we, we listed a Black Sea wheat contract in 2017 as well. So there are actually four wheat contracts available at the CME. And uh, as Cameron had mentioned earlier on about arbitrage spread trading between the different uh, commodities, uh, having four-week contracts for you to uh, arb and spread between is uh, really makes for an interesting uh, opportunity there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave uh, the rest for you to, uh, 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 to, to mull over. Um, so Australian wheat, uh, no surprises. Uh, this year is looking to be a really great year, uh, the 2021 harvest. So uh, really great news uh, for the industry uh, as well as for uh, the farmers out there. Um, now, global wheat production, um, Australia aside, you'll see that uh, there's, there's five other countries that produce a lot of wheat in the world, and it's mainly China, India, uh, which they don't export anything at all or very little, and the EU, Russia, and the US. And you can see the US is actually a very small slice of this overall uh, pie. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that to come. Um, same slide uh, for corn, but this one for wheat. Uh, you'll see that uh, the wheat supply over the years has been kind of flat. Uh, it's it's not um, really grown. Neither has it not uh, neither has it uh, not declined. Uh, unlike corn, which has grown uh, significantly over the years. Um, but usage has been also kind of flat over the years as well, which actually is is really a little bit of a surprise, because if you think about it, the U.S. population has grown dramatically over the years. Uh, every year, the you know, U.S. population continues to increase, but yet uh, total usage of wheat uh, fat lines. So it kind of tells you that uh, wheat consumption or rather bread uh, or noodle consumption in the US has kind of actually declined on a per capita basis. Um, now, again, the same chart. Uh, and in the case of uh, the US stocks use ratio, you see that they've actually dipped off uh, quite a fair bit over the last few years. Uh, in essence, basically, the U.S. wheat farmer is beginning to decrease uh, their acreage uh, planted to wheat and are looking for other commodities to, to, grow, um, uh, to grow crops with uh, as opposed to wheat. And, and that's because of the fact that um, as time goes on, uh, the, you know, uh, countries like uh, uh, Russia and, the, and Ukraine are beginning to be very big producers of very low-cost wheat, and this has impacted um, of uh, uh, farming margins for wheat in the U.S. And as a result, uh, you're beginning to see uh, marginal areas within the U.S. beginning to switch over to other crops, other cash crops that can yield a better profit. 
So this, is, this doesn't bode well for the stocks use ratio because it means that um, stocks are beginning to decline uh, even as usage continues to be stable. Um, on the world front, uh, on the other hand, you see that the reverse is true, uh, where stocks are actually on, the, on a sharp increase. And this is obviously no doubt to the very uh, new powerhouses of uh, wheat production, uh, which is um, the ex-Soviet Union, uh, Russia and Ukraine, as well as South America. They're beginning to produce more and more wheat. Um, a little uh, uh, bird's eye view of where wheat is grown. Um, and uh, two different kinds of wheat are grown in the US, uh, winter wheat as well as spring wheat. Uh, in Australia, most of the wheat grown in Australia is winter wheat. Now, uh, wheat production, again, um, a very good gauge of where volatility is when you trade these markets and you know, when to pay attention. Um, winter wheat, uh, there's two really uh, key areas, and that's one is when planting is, uh, is going in, uh, obviously in winter, as the name implies, uh, in fall and autumn, or rather. And uh, the other will be, in the case of the US, uh, it will be in the month of May, because uh, the month of May is when um, the wheat crop uh, begins uh, to be, uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, its it yields begin to be uh, cemented around about that time. Uh, spring wheat follows a different cycle, and Australia, of course, being on the other side of the of the planet uh, in the southern hemisphere, uh, follows uh, uh, an an opposite cycle. Okay, again, uh, you see again the uh, USDA charts. I'm giving you the link as well. Uh, feel free to browse at your at your uh, time. Uh, and um, again, the same thing, uh, US winter wheat has just started. So this, we're looking at a 2021 crop that's going to the ground right now. As you can see, it's not really in, in a great condition compared to previous years. Um, while spring wheat uh, is still not uh, in season yet. So uh, nothing has been planted. And this is the old chart from 2020. Okay, so uh, keep, keep track of these links and the USDA. Again, lots of great information there. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about, about wheat and um, the U.S. situation. You'll see that, uh, as mentioned earlier on, uh, the U.S. farmer is beginning to reduce uh, the amount of wheat that they plant. Uh, and you can see that in the form of a decreased acreage that has been allocated towards wheat. Uh, but on the other hand, wheat production continues to grow, uh, again, uh, due to the big powerhouses in uh, Brazil and um, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, but as a result of this, what you'll see is that the countries that have been producing over the years have increasingly become more and more uh, marginal uh, producers uh, on the world scale. And in fact, uh, the world wheat dynamics are changing and the US is now no longer the primary exporter of wheat uh, into the world. So what does that tell us? Um, if, you know, if you're looking at the markets and you're looking to, to trade, um, to, to trade these products. In essence, basically what it tells you is that um, corn, which, is, which, which you saw in the charts previously, um, a, lot of this, a lot of corn is exported. And as a result, um, global supply demand fundamentals uh, will play a very big part in driving um, corn prices. Wheat, on the other hand, um, continues to, uh, in the case of the US, continues to lose ground in terms of production. And over time, what you'll see is that the U.S. will become uh, less and less uh, influenced by, by global pricing, but more and more influenced by domestic pricing. Now, having said that, the U.S. is still an exporter of wheat in the world. So as a result, uh, what you'll see is that U.S. prices will still need to correlate well with global pricing and will need to compete with other exporting countries, like, for example, Australia. That's a good example uh, when it comes to wheat pricing. So that it will have a, a very uh, close link to global supply demand. Uh, but at the same time, you can obviously see that as the other regions be begin to become very big exporters of uh, wheat globally, uh, you begin to see that they will ha begin to have a, have a, a serious impact uh, on uh, the supply demand fundamentals. So in the case of wheat, you know, um, one must keep a lookout on what's going on in Ukraine and, um, and uh, Russia and Brazil. Uh, whereas in the corn, you know, there's probably less need to, to look, out, uh, look out for that. Uh, it's probably more how the U.S. crop uh, pans out. Uh, there will be a bigger influence on the trajectory of prices. 
So um, I just wanted to wrap up uh, on this and, and talk about a few things, a uh, few other things. Uh, and one of it is actually um, the, um, the benefit of spread trading. And what you'll see is that because there are so many different uh, weak contracts, you can obviously spread trade between them. One very popular trade that I do know a lot of traders do, do trade, and uh, I speak to a lot of traders uh, in the course of my work here, is that they do look at uh, trading uh, the, the geographical spreads, uh, basically trading um, spreads of different origins. And, and, that's, uh, and, and that uh, actually pans down a little bit to uh, currency factors, uh, as well as the fact that uh, if a country isn't exporting as much as it could, uh, then very, very likely it's probably going to, um, prices are probably going to drop in order for it to be more export competitive and, and vice versa. If it's exported too much, then prices are likely to rise to, uh, to sort of rein in uh, any further exports from going out of the country. So uh, it's a very, very nice um, uh, spreads that I know a lot of uh, traders love to look at and trade. Uh, so this is one thing they can look at with four different wheat contracts available at CME. Uh, the other thing that's that's uh, also worth mentioning, uh, and I wanted to also say this is, uh, and 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 this kind of ties in with uh, uh, corn as well. Uh, there are traders that look at the wheat corn spread. Um, this is a very interesting spread trade as well, uh, because as much as we would love for wheat to go to uh, for food, uh, some wheat does go for feed as well. And uh, at certain points in time, uh, there will be um, certain spreads between wheat and corn that can be uh, very interesting uh, for, you to, for you to look at the, the difference in spreads. I remember one year where wheat prices dropped uh, to the same prices as corn, uh, which is really a huge surprise. And uh, wheat being higher in protein than corn uh, would, uh, would be of a greater value when feeding animals. Right? Because when you feed animals, what's expensive? It's not the carbohydrate, it's the protein. So wheat having a high protein content to corn, uh, any feeder at the same price would rather feed wheat than corn. So again, an interesting spread for traders to look out uh, for as well. Um, finally, I know I've taken up uh, a lot of time and I'm ready to hand the mic back to uh, Cameron, but I just wanted to uh, just show you very, very quickly four additional uh, reports. Uh, that are very important uh, when trading this th these products uh, that uh, that um, that uh, you should pay attention to as well. Uh, the first and foremost is what we call the WASTI report, uh, which is this one. Uh, it's called the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. Uh, the U.S. produces a global supply demand estimate uh, every month, um, and this month, in fact, is actually tonight. Uh, released at 12 p.m. Eastern Time uh, in the U.S. So uh, we wait to see the November WASTI report. Um, I've always like, like, likened this to the equivalent of the employment report uh, if you're trading equities. This would be the employment uh, report equivalent uh, for commodities because you, uh, in commodities, you're really talking about uh, supply and demand. And the WASTI gives a very good uh, picture of uh, the global supply and demand uh, and even broken down by specific countries. Um, U.S. acreage and quarterly stocks report. This is another important one. It doesn't come out as often as the WASTI. Uh, it comes out only four times a year at the end of every quarter, except for 31st December because of Christmas. Uh, they release it in early January instead. Uh, but in essence, basically, it's released every quarter, and it kind of tells you um, uh, the stocks that are available. Um, Two things, the March report and June report are really interesting and important because they also include the area that is expected to be planted in, in the March report and the actual acreage that's been planted in the June report. Now, these two really can set the markets on fire, so it's a report that you should definitely uh, watch out for. The September and January reports are not so exciting because it has very little to do with the uh, actual crop that, that had been planted. But this year, the September report was really interesting because, um, and I wanted to touch on this, uh, about China and the trade deal that they signed with the United States. Uh, they have been importing a lot of U.S. agriculture over the last uh, year. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar. Uh, there was a long, um, uh, a long negotiation between uh, President Trump and President Xi over the, over the last two years which they finally hammered out a good trade agreement in January this year. And since then, 
um, China has been importing a lot of U.S. agriculture. And in September, uh, what typically would be a sleepy report actually shocked the market into activity because um, the market didn't expect uh, the drawdown in U.S. stocks to be that great uh, when actually it, it did and all of that was being exported to China. So the market got a, got a root shock and the market made a really big rally as a result uh, from that report. So again, uh, important reports to pay attention to. Um, other than that, there's just two other reports that I, that I thought worth mentioning um, before, before I cap off and hand the mic over. And one is export sales and the other is the crop progress. Uh, crop progress, uh, um, I had shown everyone a couple of um, snapshots of those uh, reports. The export sales report tends to be very sleepy as well. This is weekly. Uh, but again, um, because of the trade deal that had been signed, these export report, uh, reports that come out every week have, uh, have been a very important indicator of how much uh, is being sold and how much is being committed uh, uh, to be shipped to China. So again, um, usually traditionally a very sleepy report, but in this year, this has really uh, picked up a lot of steam uh, in terms of um, uh, eyeballs uh, that are glued to this report as well. Okay, with that, um, I will show you our disclaimer. Uh, it's much longer than the one Cameron had shown for his. Uh, um, I would, um, uh, it will be a very long uh, time to explain all of it, but in essence, basically, uh, please do have a look at it uh, before I hand the mic back to Cameron. I hope they're speed readers, Nelson. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that was great information. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge. And and I, and I think one thing that's great about these products is that the you know trading these types of products is that you know for people who love researching uh, and uh, and and looking for you know the reports, there's some really great fundamental analysis you can get. And it's like you said, I love how you said it's just really Economics 101. It's really just supply and demand factors around the world. So um, it's it's interesting. I, was, I haven't looked at corn or wheat for years. Um, I, I did start to look at it a little while ago, but having the opportunity to to look at it today was interesting. And just to uh, it, you know, looking at the charts, it does obey a lot of technical rules that we still look at on our larger charts when we're trading. Uh, but um, but there's also lots of you know, fundamentals that can move things around as well. And, and I think there's, there's windows where you can trade um, and there's times when it's maybe not, not so good to trade as well. So um, I think that's, that's I think it's, a, it's quite a seasonal type um, uh, product or products. So what I would like to do, can everyone see my screen? I'm just going to, I've just taken the screen off Nelson there. I just want to quickly go through, uh, and if you've got any questions too, please, we will do a Q&A at the end, but please send your questions through and, um, and we'll get them answered for you if you are interested in, in anything about these types of uh, markets. So just uh, what I'm going to talk about is just basically about the corn and the wheat futures, uh, a little bit about the contract size and the full size contracts are 5,000 bushels. Uh, is one contract or the mini, there are mini sized contracts you can uh, be involved with as well, which is, is a different um, code. Uh, and you can see down there the ticker symbols. Uh, ZC is the, the main contract, is the full size contract. Then the mini size contract is the XC. Now I was trying on my on my trading platform today, which is uh, NinjaTrader, and I could only bring up the ZC, which is the, the full size contract. So um, if you are if you are looking to trade the micro or the mini size contract, you may need to call your broker to see if they can activate that that data feed for you. It shouldn't be a problem. It'd just be a settings uh, issue uh, if you if you don't see it on your trading platform. Uh, just in terms of the tick size, uh, and and so you're aware, the the price is expressed in cents. Uh, it's currently the market's currently around uh, four dollars, so four hundred. Uh, is, is the current price or around about that price. So a tick is actually worth a quarter of a cent. So, and uh, and one tick is worth $12.50. So same as the S&P 500, it's the same dollar value. 
uh, the mini size contract is a tenth of that as well. So very similar to the micro um, indexes, uh, the same same price. So once again, contracts are uh, spaced out. You have December, March, May, July, and September. So it's always good to to understand the primary contracts, and you want to be trading the contracts which obviously do have the, the most volume. Uh, the trading hours are just typical CME hours. Uh, nothing different there to to that to the corn product. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it on for that slide. Uh, a little bit about the wheat products. Uh, ZW, that's the primary one, Chicago soft red uh, winter wheat. That's that one there. Uh, that's ZW. And then there's the Kansas City um, uh, hard, I think it's the hard red wheat, which is KE. Once again, I could only pull up the ZW contract. So if you were looking at seriously uh, trading these products, you, you would maybe need to talk to your broker to get these or how to get these activated on, onto your platform. But very similar, it's all they're all expressed in cents. Um, so the, the, the price, the prices are, are basically the same as the as the corn. Um, and also you do have the mini size contracts as well. So there are the ticker codes down there. So if you want to have a look, uh, ZW, uh, XW, and then there's the Kansas City ones down here, KE or KC. So they're the they're the primary um, uh, contract specifications on those. Also, Nelson talked about the Australian wheat futures as well, uh, which is traded through the CME. Um, I don't know a whole bunch about this type of product. I don't, I don't know whether, Nelson, you could explain a little bit more about um, how these are traded. I think they're, they're probably traded more, like you said, off screen, more through a particular broker. You'd have to you know, speak to those uh, parties that do that. So if you are interested in the Australian wheat market and you'd like to trade that, um, please let us know and we can put you in contact with the particular um, brokers in Australia that will give you opportunity to trade these products. Is there anything more about that, Nelson, that you, you think is important to cover off? Uh, no, I, I, I think you I think you covered it uh, really well, Cameron. Uh, the um, I guess the the only other thing uh, that's worth mentioning is that the Australian contract is based on Fop Quinana, so it's really a, a Western Australian wheat contract uh, as opposed to an Eastern Australian wheat contract. Uh, although I'm I'm pretty sure that both uh, West and East uh, wheat prices correlate. Right. Okay. And, uh, and Nelson talked a little bit about the spreads as well. So if you were trading the different types of spreads, uh, I'm not familiar so much myself in, in this type of trading, uh, trading the spreads, but um, I know it's, it's, it's very, uh, very popular with a lot, of, uh, a lot of traders out there. So if you did need to uh, you know, find out a little bit more about that, I'm sure um, we could put you in the, in the right place to find out more about um, speci specialists who are into this type of uh, type of trading, but uh, there's definitely there's there's definitely a lot of uh, traders that arbitrage all types of products. Particularly, I know in the uh, in the U.S. indexes, a lot of a lot of tr um, big traders trade the differences in price between or the imbalances or differences in price between um, say the Russell or the Nasdaq or the Dow Jones and the and the S&P 500. So I know that. You know, there's a lot of that goes on, and I'm sure a lot of this goes on in the wheat markets as well. So let's talk a little bit about the analysis, and I want to bring over a, a few charts. But Nelson talked about this as well, so I won't I won't talk too much in detail. But the the corn futures, if you're looking at corn futures, the the, the primary reports obviously coming out of the USDA. So he mentioned about those prospective plantings reports that talk about the quantity and the type of crops. US farmers intend to plant. There's the grain stocks report, which is quarter yearly, monthly crop production reports. There's also weekly export reports for information on global demand as well. Weather reports can be very handy. And then also historical data. So historical charts, you know, price charts, what's happened in the past uh, around uh, certain uh, scenarios, for instance, drought or good crop production, you know, how has the market reacted to those sorts of Situation, so you can see a lot of get a lot of crossover from what's happened in the past. 
In terms of uh, charting and price patterns, and I'll go through this in a little bit with corn, we generally see highs in the market around June and August, uh, and then we see lows in the market generally around November, around that harvest time. Um, June to August can be very volatile, and that's what Nelson was saying as well during the US summer, and this is due to corn sensitivity to weather. This is when they get their, their you know, they're, they're either they get droughts or they get lots of storms around that time of year that, you know, the tornadoes and those sorts of things that, that can cause havoc on, on crop. Um, hot, dry weather in July can also affect the pollination and the yields plunge. So, you know, look at you, the next time you're having a, a corn on the cob, have a look and see how many little beads you've got there to see how, how the corn actually fed. If it, was a, if it was a good one, you'd have a lot more, um, a lot more, uh, big juicy beads in there than those little tiny shriveled up ones. Uh, also, uh, watch the US dollar with corn uh, because it is it is very uh, reactive to US dollar uh, and the high US dollar makes more expensive for global buyers and reduces demand. And we'll see this in the charts, what's happened recently. Also, like uh, Nelson said, watch for uh, fuel as well, the oil prices. There's, there's a link between that as well, just because of the amount of ethanol that's now used in the fuel and, and currently we're seeing in the charts is a seven month high. And, and a lot of this has been due to the, the US dollar starting to, um, to, to strengthen up a little bit against some of the, the major currencies. Um, and I'll, I'll bring over a, a chart on that. I've got a weekly chart I'd like to, to show you. Wrong one, didn't want wheat, I'm gonna get corn. Um, And this is this is interesting. We've seen, you know, when I scrunch up this chart, you'll see that corn's been on uh, quite a big slide for for many years, uh, and this is obviously due to this global uh, global production that's happening around other other parts of the world, uh, but also the strength of the U.S. dollar as well has has obviously affected the prices, and we've seen we've seen a strengthening in the U.S. dollar uh, for for many years now, uh, especially you know with, uh, with when uh, Donald Trump's been involved, uh, we've seen the US dollar very much strengthen. strengthen. But as you can see here, uh, this is the recent bottom, which was back in um, uh, last year, I believe, uh, or at the beginning, sorry, August this year, we found the bottom in, in the market down around that $3 mark. And now we've had a nice strong uh, jump up. And this is due to partly there's been some I think some global dryness around the world as well that, that's affected uh, the, the pr production and harvests around the world. Uh, but uh, you can see that we're we're bouncing back. And um, if we look at the most recent range, it's interesting from a technical analysis perspective. Just like any market, these markets do respect these these retracement levels, these Fibonacci levels. And we can see here the market has come right back in line with the, uh, I'll just grab my pointer, right in line with this 50 Fibonacci, just over the $4 mark. So obviously these round numbers are very significant milestones for the markets and they can cause uh, support and resistance in the market as well. So we can see that the market has broken the $4 mark here and, uh, and now we're just sort of rotating around it. But as I said earlier, that we generally see a low around November. Uh, so maybe uh, corn could potentially build, put a little low in here, and then we may see an increase, uh, especially with the, the trade deals that's going on with the United States and, um, and China, obviously increasing the, the demand for, for uh, corn and other grains. Uh, we'll see, we've seen an increase in price in corn. And we've also seen this in wheat as well. But in, this is a weekly chart, by the way. So uh, interesting, if I scrunch up this chart and what I wanted to show you was what Nelson was talking about, the most volatile months are generally from June to, to August. So these these vertical lines I put in here is June to, to August. Um, and you can see obviously we've had a, a fair bit of volatility outside of those, those, those uh, months as well. But if you, we look, we keep scrunching up. If we looked at last year's crop, you can see here from 
June to August was very volatile, extremely volatile. And then we made a low in this November month as well, which is the harvest month. If we keep scrolling back, you'll see the market has been in a, on a downtrend for, for a long time. But once again, there was a low here in November, November, December, we had volatility in June, August. So even if you, you know, thought, well, you know what, I'm gonna start looking at, at these products around these times, these key times like June and August, look for potential trade opportunities, uh, it might be a great idea for some people that, you know, especially if you're a farmer um, and you're interested in, in these types of products uh, and it's your livelihood, it might, it might give you an extra uh, eye on or an extra form of income. Um, once again, going back to uh, 2018, you can see here low made in November and volatility in June to August. So you can see these patterns, it's quite, they're quite predictable. That's what I love about these these products. I, um, I don't do them, I don't trade them at all, but it's definitely something I'd be interested for a longer term investment uh, or a longer term trade. Um, you know, maybe a two or three month trade, there's some great opportunity. Once again, volatility here from June to, to August, and then around the harvest time, uh, I felt uh, just a little low was made in that but um, and, and that pattern seems to repeat all the way down the line all the way and you can see you know obviously you know the, the strength of the US dollar um, has really affected the, the price of of corn and it's just been on a slide uh, ever since um, you know for right right back to I think the you know 2012 which is interesting because um, there was a commodities peak around 2011, 2012 in, in all commodities, especially uh, your energy commodities uh, and metals commodities. We saw peaks around those times. So, um, you know, in terms of a commodities index, um, the, these commodities, if you're looking at a commodities index, obviously corn, wheat, they, they all are involved in that. And we've, we've seen a downturn, but, um, you know, I, I, mean, I, think, I think we're going to see you know, if you're looking on a large scale, I think, we, you know, if you're looking for a longer term trade in these products, I think, and obviously, you know, there we are still in a downtrend. Um, if we break $5, 5 525 that may signal an opportunity that the market's in a definitely much more of a, a longer, uh, longer term uptrend, but we're definitely seeing the first look of an uptrend. And, and as, you know, as, as our famous, a famous grains trader from, you know, the early 1900s, W.D. Gann, he always looked at the, the best opportunity that was always the first swing, uh, the first swing off a, on a weekly chart, uh, on a larger chart, off a low. And, you know, we're looking at potentially getting in that area of that first swing starting to occur. I think if we can get a little bit of a sell down back down here to maybe potentially down a 50% retracement of this lower retracement here, or this, this lower leg here, we may see some really good long-term buying opportunities uh, in corn. Um, if it, and I think, you know, this magic $4 mark, if we hold above this magic $4 mark, I think we're gonna see a nice little move back up to five, uh, $5. So that's corn, uh, interesting uh, to look at that one. Um, if we look at wheat, uh, once again, the reports, uh, you know, if, you, if you jot it down, though, if you need these, reports I'm sure we can send through these slides to you if you'd need them uh, if you're interested but these are some of the major reports and uh, Nelson explained all that as well uh, in terms of uh, charting and price patterns uh, we generally see price declines during harvest which is May to July for wheat because it is a different uh, a different uh, season particularly the the, the winter wheats uh, price can also decline uh, if wheat survives uh, winter uh, and and uh, the, the crop is in good shape, we can generally see a price decline. Uh, price volatility from planting to harvest, so October to the end of July is generally when uh, we'll see most volatility in the wheat product. So it's a little bit longer term uh, than, than corn. Uh, price is susceptible to international influences, so turmoil in other wheat producing countries uh, can affect price. The US dollar can impact on demand of US wheat uh, and wheat trades in concert with other crops. So 
uh, and other forms of wheat as well. So speculators do look for that those price spreads for trading opportunities. And this year, um, we've seen an increase in the price of wheat, uh, and we've, we've bounced off these significant lows. Like Nelson was saying, we got down to around about four dollars. We've seen that uh, wheat has gone up to around six dollars now, and price is currently being driven by dryness around the globe, and this is tightening the supply on on wheat currently. So, uh, if we look at the chart on wheat, uh, let me bring over the the weekly chart. So there's that level that um, uh, Nelson was talking about around uh, the four dollar mark, uh, four fifty mark that uh, wheat uh, dropped down to. And as you can see now, wheat's cracked that six dollar mark, and it's it's very much correlated in its movement to corn, the way it's moved up uh, from these lows. Um, and you can see once again, I've marked out you know the volatile times, you know from when planting to harvest. We can see that we've got a fair amount of volatility in this time uh, from October through till, till May and then we create a low uh, in the uh, from Oct um, from May to uh, August is when you'll find a low will be created because that's during the harvest is when you get the, a low is generally uh, put in play. Uh, so now obviously planting's restarted again here um, in, in the, the wheat crop. And, uh, and yeah, once again, I think it's going to be an interesting move. We've already seen that nice swing back up already on the weekly charts. Um, here, you can see the first swing was down around here. There was a nice move. Once again, if you, you know, technical analysis, if you like Fibonacci extensions, you can see the first swing from the bottom here. Uh, got a nice trade all the way back up to the 100 extension, which is over here at $6. So once again, a nice, nice little area to look for a potential short around that six dollar mark, uh, particularly during volatile seasons. So you know you can really, you know, if you tune into this and if you if you want to day trade these products, you can. They're like Nelson said, they're very liquid. Um, if if I can show you, um, oh, what, what's, what I want to show you before I go and show you a smaller scale chart is just if you look at the harvest season. Quite predictable. You get these lows that are that are uh, brought in around in the ha harvest season, um, and the volatility is in that other month. So from October through to May, you'll see the volatility, and it's quite consistent. When you scroll back over the years, uh, once again there was a low put in place here. Uh, there was some nice volatility, not as much volatility as prior years. Um, little low put in place here. Uh, and not so much volatility in this year as well. But once again, some some definite price action. No no trends being formed, but but nice nice price movement over time. Um, so that's just going back a few years. Also interesting, I did note uh, with these uh, charts as well. It's just if you look at the and we recently uh, spoke at our annual conference with a with a professional GAN trader and. Gan looked. Gan was a big wheat trader. Wheat, soybeans, corn, commodities. He was all over it, and he looked at uh, weeks and and um, and days, and he looked at these significant time counts, and he used used 60, uh, 30s, uh, 60s, 90s, so fractions of 30. He used that for potential turning points in the market, and it was interesting looking at wheat just from these significant from high to high was not you know not perfectly at 60 weeks but you know very similar 56 weeks um, also here from that high to that high 56 weeks um, also from from that high to this high over here was 86 weeks almost 90 weeks so it, it's interesting when you look at uh, some of the you know the, the, the time counts uh, here's 58 weeks from this low to this major low here interesting. Very close to very close to 60 weeks, uh, which is what GAN would have looked at as well for potential turning points in the market. So there's a few little things you can look at in terms of longer term, like using time counts and uh, and obviously looking at the certain uh, knowing the season or what time you're in, whether you're in in the planting season or or in the harvest season. 
um, and to, to, to sort of look at potential opportunities for trades. So you can build up trading um, trading uh, plans around these times of year as well. So just very, very interesting. I've never really looked at this before. I just sort of looked at some you know, key uh, uh, information that Nelson sent me and, and I found it quite interesting how you can use the charts as well as all the information that, that you can get from all these reports, the US, State, US um, Department of Agriculture reports and, and many, many other reports that are out there can give you great intel into what the likely uh, supply and demand forces are and you can basically take trades based on, on those forces, which I think is fantastic. Um, just in wrapping up as well, before we get to the Q&A, there's many resources. Um, so if you, if you want any resources on any of these products, uh, please let us know and we can send you through um, all these websites and uh, particular um, sites that you can access. Um, this, this weekly market report that the CME does as well, you can get access to that as well uh, via the CME group. So there's loads of resources on the CME website that are freely available and uh, very, very thorough research. Also, um, I'm not, I don't know much about the options side of things, but I'm sure Nelson can explain if, if um, Nelson does, do you know if options has, uh, you know, the, the, the difference between puts and calls, does that have much to do with trading decisions um, for, for traders? Do, do they look at that? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Cam. Um, I would say yes, in general. Uh, I do know a lot of I do know of a lot of traders that do look at uh, uh, puts and calls, uh, especially especially if there's very large sizes that that have traded uh, during the week. Uh, mm. It's something that you know they 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 look at. Uh, they look at the strikes uh, because uh, there's also uh, traders that think that you know it may gravitate towards that particular strike uh, when it expires. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of very interesting things to to look at, and, and traders do do uh, actively look at it. Um, the other thing that maybe is worth mentioning, uh, just very quickly, is that um, um, uh, at the CME and, and many other exchanges, um, we have what we call short dated options, which are weekly options, and the weekly options are great tools uh, for uh, folks to use especially around report times because um, um, they're very short duration and we uh, and uh, I do know of traders that, that just buy them just before the report and then you know uh, write it through the report and if it's a if it's a massive report you know um, uh, their options are going to be in the money if it's not then you know they, they paid a little bit but um, yeah. uh, they've not taken very much risk okay yeah so there's there's lots of different strategies around that and um, once again, lots of lots of ag intel, lots of resources uh, that you can access from the CME group uh, via that website there, and you can sign up and you can get um, all the reports that that come out from the CME on a, on a regular basis. So, guys, that concludes our our presentation tonight. Um, what I would like to uh, give you before we go to our Q and A is I just would like to make mention that we do run our our Wednesday masterclasses uh, weekly for people who are interested into learning how to day trade uh, the the, uh, the markets, the, the futures markets, the CME products. Uh, so if you are interested to find out a little bit more about what we do here at IDTA, we do have our webinars on every uh, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Queensland time, and you can register for those at our website, idta.com.au. Go to our events page. And also would like to advertise our next masterclass, which is on in two weeks time. It will be on the energy products. So uh, energy products, oil and gas. We, we do have a few really, very good oil traders in our trading community. It'd be great for you to come along and uh, check that out. And this will be with Nicholas Dupuy, uh, who's the Senior Director for Energy Products in the Asia, Asia Pacific region for the CME Group. So that will be on uh, next um, in a fortnight's time. So same time as this webinar, but in two weeks. So um, over to you guys. Are there any questions that you would like to, to ask of Nelson while we've got his, his expertise with us tonight?
Thanks, Robert. And thanks, Anthony, some nice feedback. Fantastic knowledge and delivery, Nelson, great job. Um, thanks, Cameron and Nelson, for a great session. And thank you for your insights tonight. So thank you, guys. Thank you, so, yes, thank you. This is your time, guys. If you are interested to find out a little bit more about uh, what we what um, what we do and and uh, how you can trade these products, they're they're very liquid products. I was just looking here at a a five minute chart, and um, just looking, especially during the the U.S. market. This is where this is where you'll find most of the volume traded uh, in these in these markets and. You know, I'm looking at the the volumes last night. Um, was was I think the opening candle of the U.S. market. We had um, 10,000 contracts exchanged on corn um, for the first five minutes of trade. So um, very very liquid. Uh, they really start to the, the, the pre-market last night even. It even moved on that uh, vaccine announcement. I'm looking at corn. Corn moved up when that uh, came out. The, the you know even corn moved, which is <laughs> which is interesting. Um, I'll just show you that. I'll just show you that chart now. N not as much as obviously the index has moved, but that was that when the news came out last night about uh, the Pfizer announcement. It was a very big move in the markets. But yeah, a lot more volume traded around the uh, the US time slot. It's yeah, yeah. Uh, Cameron, if I, if I may, if I may also add, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the bulk of the volume is done during US time zone, but uh, during Asian hours as well, uh, Australian hours, uh, I can tell you that uh, you know, just looking at the screen every now and then, uh, the markets, uh, the markets for the for the front month, for the spot month, uh, you know, they run uh, in. in at least when it comes to retail trader size, you know, not a problem. Uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 lots uh, and uh, one tick wide. So the markets are very tight as well during during Asian hours. Uh, if you're looking yeah. at trade size, like you're looking at 100 lots or 500 lots, then, you know, uh, maybe the US hours might be better for you. But if you're looking at 5, 10, you know, that kind of size uh, shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, so there is definitely, you know, Look, a lot of movement on that day there, big volatility. So there's, there's no, there's lots of price movement. Like these are, these are ten tick. Um, like I remember when I first started trading the, um, the indexes, and S and P 500 was lucky to move, you know, ten, or well, 40, 40 ticks. So yeah, 40, like ten points, ten points a session. Now, you know, this is moving. You know, 40, 40 points um, roughly in this session. So it's, it's, it's quite quite good movement um, uh, for these markets. Uh, so definitely definitely day tradable products as well. So uh, and that's that's corn. I haven't even looked at wheat. Um, if I look at wheat, um, see if there's any similarities there. Um, Michael says liquidity is obviously increased from eight years ago. Do you think it is will maintain liquidity in the future? Um, question for me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yes. Uh, liquidity yeah. is obviously increased from eight years ago. Do you think it will maintain liquidity in the future? That's from Michael. Okay, uh, Michael, thank, thanks for the question. Uh, I would say definitely yes, uh, it will continue to persist. Um, uh, the markets have just grown structurally uh, and, and we've seen a lot of new participants come into the space. Um, so I would, I would, um, I would be, you know, you know I, I, I feel fairly comfortable to say that uh, the markets will continue to, um, to grow and expand uh, as time goes on. And, um, and uh, you know these markets, they they continue to um, to be volatile. Um, and uh, I just had a look at the implied volatility for the uh, options uh, before coming online. Uh, we're talking about between 22 to 28 percent volatility. So 
the markets continue to to you know to to be volatile, to be very active and um, uh, very uh, very well participated as well. So yeah, I expect the um, the liquidity to to continue to to stick around for some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent, great question. Thanks, Michael. Just checking to see if there's any more questions coming in. So there you can see there was a nice little downtrend there on the on wheat. Nice little move down there. Once again, that's like about a one, two, three, about a 50, 50 point move there. And this was last night, actually, the reaction to the Pfizer announcement. Big rally. So it was a very good, very good for the economy in, in all markets. Really enjoyed that, uh, enjoyed that news. But anyway, it was short lived, but um, interesting, interesting study. So guys, I think that concludes the evening. Um, if we don't have any more questions, um, we might have an early mark tonight, Nelson. You go and enjoy, enjoy your <laughs> afternoon. Uh, but um, thank you so much, Nelson. Really enjoyed your company tonight and your, your expertise and knowledge. And it, I think it really opened up a few people's minds to, to you know, just the, the depth of products that the, the CME offer and, uh, and just the, the tradability of these products. and and just the amount of research that that's that's done and that's uh, freely attract uh, freely available for traders to take advantage of to to make the best trading decisions that they can and uh, these markets are are moving uh, constantly and there's there's wonderful trade opportunities whether you're a short term trader or a longer term trader there's there's great opportunities and uh, great leverage opportunities to take to take advantage of as well so Thanks, Nelson. Um, look forward to meeting you again, and uh, we'll see you hopefully again soon sometime. Th thanks, Cameron. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks, everybody, for dialing in, and um, have a great evening, guys. Awesome. And, guys, thank you once again, and we'll see you in, in uh, Tuesday fortnight's time for our, our next uh, session on the energy products, so oil and, and gas and various other products. Thank you so much. Have a great night, and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.